Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Email Marketing and Social Media for Nonprofits. We have lots of things to cover today, so we're going to get started right away. My name is Jill Bastian. I'm the Training and Education Manager here at Vertical Response, and with me today is Ellery Long. He does social media here. And we have a special guest, Julie Harmon from Peak Parent Center. Um, Julie also volunteers on another nonprofit group, so she has a lot of perspectives about um, different marketing that comes from um, nonprofits. Also, just so you guys know, she's my sister, so if we sound a lot alike, that's why, and it isn't your computer that's broken. <laughs> um, usually, uh, or actually today, we always um, record our webinars, um, and so just to let you know, we are recording this. This is probably the most commonly asked question, so I'm just going to let you guys know now. We are recording this, so if you want to take a look at this at a future date, you can. It will be posted on our uh, help site at uh, probably tomorrow afternoon. Um, and speaking of questions, um, we do a Q&A at the end. So as I said, we have lots and lots of things going on um, in our slides today. We're going to try to make this webinar be about 45 minutes long. Right, Ellery? Try doing the imperative <laughs> words. Um, and then at the end, we will do a Q&A. Um, I'll be more than happy to stay on and answer questions um, past 2 o'clock. I don't know if Julie's able, Julie or Ellery is able to stay too much longer than that. But um, we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. So if you have questions, if you look in your GoToWebinar window, you'll see a little box. And go ahead and type your questions into that. And we will be able to answer as many of those as we can at the end. So let's go ahead and get started. This is what we're going to cover today. Um, we're basically going to take you through email marketing for nonprofits, some of the reasons why, how to create a list as a nonprofit, um, some ideas for content. We're going to go over some of the reporting information. Um, and then we're also going to cover uh, social media for nonprofits. And then, as I said at the end, we will do a Q&A. So one of the first things that we're going to cover is why have an email. Um, I'm assuming or hoping that a lot of you already are doing email marketing, uh, probably with us, but you could be doing email marketing somewhere else. If you're new to this whole email marketing um, idea, this is some of the reasons why you might want to start sending out an email to the people who are your constituents, the people on your mailing list, your donors, whoever, whatever it is you call them. Um, emails help to build relationships, which is what you're really trying to do when you're trying to get someone to do something for you. So if you're trying to get someone to donate to you, if you're trying to get them to volunteer, um, or if you just have um, a business where you need someone to make a purchase, a relationship is going to help that to move along. You can also use it to grow your organization and to get referrals. And we'll talk a little bit about more, a little more about this when we talk about list building. Um, also, it's a great way to stay in front of your audience, and you want to do that because as um, people need whatever services that your organization is providing or your business is providing, you want to be the company or the organization that comes top of mind when they need the help or the services that you offer. So by sending out a regular email, you'll be able to um, keep in front of them and keep your business or your organization um, in their mind. And as a nonprofit, you probably have events that you're hosting or attending or um, whatever you're doing with events. And it's a great way just to keep in touch with the people who have signed up to either volunteer for your events or who have signed up to attend the event. So you can send out reminder emails as your events come close. Again, it's a great way to um, establish yourself as an expert. So. You know your business well. You know your organization well. And by sending out an email, you can help establish that in the minds of other people who might be needing what you offer. Um, and again, it's a great way just to keep in touch either with thank you emails or referrals. So just a few things. Um, this is kind of an anatomy of how email marketing works or what you're going to be doing with email marketing. And we're going to take you through some of these today. First of all, you need a list to send your email to. And when you're sending out through a system like Vertical Response, um, any kind of uh, company that does what we do, we all require an opt-in mailing list. 
which means people who have signed up in some way to receive emails from your company. Then you need to have a goal or objective of your email. Are you trying to do some fundraising? Are you just trying to make people aware of what you're doing? Are you trying to get people to um, sign petitions? Is there a certain number of people you're trying to get to donate or a certain number of donations? Whatever your objective is, make sure you keep that in mind when you're creating your email. Once your email's gone out, you're going to have your recipients read it, of course, because it's going to be fascinating, and so they're going to want to know what's going on, and they will read it. You're going to need to have a call to action in your email. Some of you have probably attended some of our webinars in the past, and we do talk about call to action a lot. Um, and I have it highlighted in red, and there's an asterisk, because a little bit out of order, that's going to be the next slide, because as a nonprofit, you actually have probably more options for your call to action than maybe just um, a business that's trying to sell products. Um, so we're going to go over that in a minute. And then once your recipients have taken an action and your email has gone out, you'll be able to take a look at the reporting metrics for your email and measure how effective it was, which will help you send even more effective emails in the future. So we're going to talk about numbers a little bit um, at, at the end of going through some of these other things. So as I said, a little out of order, but your nonprofit call to action is going to be whatever it is you want your recipients to do. And that is usually going to be make a donation or volunteer, but it could, it could depend just what your, um, your organization does. So maybe you need people to advocate for specific le legislation. So maybe they need to send an email to a politician to say, you know, you need to um, say yes or no to this particular bill, or maybe you need people to sign petitions to help. Maybe you need more volunteers. You can use an email as um, a way to get more volunteers, and that can be your call to action. So the call to action is what you want people to do when they read your email. Um, and these are just a list, uh, a list of some of the things that you can do as call to action for an, as, an, as a nonprofit. Um, I'd like to point out, as you can see, the very last bullet on here is um, a way to make buttons. So you'll notice that I put buttons on here for call to action. When I was making them, I didn't realize they were quite as patriotic as they are <laughs> when I took a look at the slide, but they're a little patriotic. That was unintentional. I have some patriotic slides in my book. Oh, that's too, so. good. So it's not just me. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of times when we're creating emails and when we're talking about um, things that you should be doing with your email marketing, um, for your call to action especially, a button is really useful. For whatever reason, people really like to click on buttons. And we did uh, some tests on our own recipients who received the VR Buzz newsletter, and we had a huge increase in our click-through rate just by adding buttons for people to click. So I would recommend that you use a button, especially if you're trying to get people to do something like donate or sign up for something. Use a button to get their attention because they are eye-catching and to get them to take the action that you want. The buttons that I have on the screen here, I created at performable.com, which is a company that does a lot of things, and buttons is not the primary thing they do, but we love them for their button technology. <laughs> I guess it's technology. Um, so if you go to performable.com slash buttons, you can create a button there, whatever color you want it to be. You can put whatever text you want on it, take a screenshot, and use it as an image in your email. Um, again, they're just really effective for getting people to take an action with your email. To get them to click on something, a button will work. Um, I'm going to say something else. Right, we, have buttons. Uh, we do have buttons coming. We don't have buttons yet. So Performable is a interim solution for you, but for those of you who are Vertical Response customers, in, by the end of the summer, but probably sooner, uh, we are building our own button builder uh, <laughs> that will be integrated with the Vertical Response app, and you can create buttons with ease. Um, also, I remembered what I was going to say. Um, if any of your recipients are reading your email on a cell phone, a button like this is much easier for them to click on than a link in your text. So again, for getting people to take action, whether they're looking at it in a cell phone or not, a button is a great way for them to do that. 
So let's now let's go back in the order of my other slide. I just had to talk about call to action because it's pretty important in emails, especially for nonprofits. Um, so I have some ideas for building lists. And I've broken them down into different ways that you might be doing it. So for example, if you were list building online, these are some ideas. Um, here at Vertical Response, when you create an account in our system, we automatically create an opt-in form for you. You can collect whatever data you want. Um, you do have to collect an email address because we require an email address to send an email. But otherwise, you can collect whatever information you would like. We give you the code, the HTML code for that form, and you can put it on your website, on your blog, on social media, wherever people might come across your organization, they can sign up to receive your emails. The information collected from this opt-in form is then added to a list in your account, and then you can send emails to them. You can also export it, so if you need to update a database outside of vertical response, you can always do that as well. But an opt-in form is free, and it's really an easy way to help grow your mailing list. If you're offering a special download, like maybe you have um, a how-to guide or something um, specific related to your organization, maybe something about volunteers, maybe about events or something like that, um, just require an email address to download the guides. Uh, you know, they don't have to give money or something like that necessarily, but giving an email address to download the guides, one, makes you know, lets you know that there's a real person downloading the guide, and then two, it helps to build your mailing list. You just need to be clear on the form that they're going to fill in that they will be added to your mailing list if, you, if they are putting in an email address there. Uh, you could also sponsor a contest or giveaway. Um, you know, maybe you have a sponsor who is willing to donate something to your organization that you could raffle off, for example, um, and just say that uh, for anyone who signs up, they'll be added on your mailing list. Again, you just need to be clear that if they're entering a contest or if they're downloading something, that if they're giving you the email address, that you will be adding them to your mailing list because it does have to be opted in. You can also continue to build your mailing list through email. So one of the things that you can do in just about any system, but also here in Vertical Response, is include a forward to a friend link in your email. When you're creating it, no matter how you're using um, our system, there's a drop-down menu that says Insert, and you can put a forward to a friend link anywhere in your email. And this is great for two reasons, because one, people can forward your content to whoever they think might be interested in it, but also the person who receives the email from the forward to a friend link will be told who was forwarding the email to them, and they'll have the option to click a link to be added to your mailing list. So again, it's an easy way to grow your list. It's also an easy way for your recipients to spread the word, and it's free. Um, you also should think about including a link to your sign-up form in your email. Of course, the people that you're mailing to on your list have already opted in, because of course those are the rules for email marketing. But it gives the opportunity for people who might be sharing it on social media to be added to your list without having to go find your website necessarily. So if it's in your email and somebody's sharing that on Facebook or on Twitter, anyone who's finding it on one of those platforms will be able to sign up to be on your list. Also, if you're sharing it um, through social media, um, on Facebook you can put an opt-in form, but Twitter of course has 140 characters and you can't really do that. But if you're sharing your email socially, you'll be also be able to get signups that way as well. Um, and that is what the screenshot is on the right-hand side. In our system, we do have a way for you to share your email on social media. Um, basically, we just create a short URL and take the um, subject line of your email, and then you can post it to Facebook or Twitter, and anyone who is following you in one of those mediums will be able to see your email, they can read the content, and again, if you have a link for them to sign up to be on your mailing list, they can do that as well. Um, you can also include a link in your email signature. So at your work, um, for your professional signature, you can include a link to your sign-up form there. Because the people that you send an email to on a regular basis may not already be on your mailing list, and it might be something that they're interested in. And of course, if you're having an event or if you're attending events, um, you can still build your mailing list even if you're talking to someone in person. So it doesn't have to be done online. It doesn't have to be done in an email. 
Um, one of the things I would definitely recommend if you do um, a lot of events yourself, that if you have any forms that people need to fill in, if they're filling in forms to um, donate or to volunteer, that you include an email address anywhere that you also have contact information so that they can be added to your mailing list. Also, when people register for your events, give them the option to be added to your mailing list. Or even if they're checking in um, and you haven't collected their email address, see if you can get them to, collect, to uh, give you their email address then. Um, if you have a front desk at your office, put a sign-up form there. Anyone who can stop by might want to put themselves on your mailing list. Um, and of course, business cards is a way for you to grow your list as well. Again, just make it clear that if somebody's handing you a business card and they said, I would like to be on your list, that you're going to put them on the list. Just because someone gives you a business card doesn't mean that they want to be put on your mailing list. They could just be exchanging information just to um, exchange information, but not necessarily expect to be on a newsletter list, for example. So um, there are more points on growing your mailing list, and I'm going to cover that on our resources slide at the end of the webinar. One of the things you have to do, though, once you get people to sign up on your mailing list, is you need to be good to them. Otherwise, they're going to unsubscribe, um, and you don't want to do that. At the very least, you need to send out an email at least once a month. And the reason that you want to do that, again, is that you want to keep your company, your organization, top of mind for your recipients, not only for the services that you're providing, but also so that they don't forget who you are and just delete your email. If you're mailing just like once a quarter or once a year, it's really likely that people will forget how they signed up to be on your list, why they're receiving your email. They could even click report this email as spam, and then that can cause some problems for you later on. So if you mail on a regular basis, they're, they're going to be more engaged with what you're sending out, and they're going to um, want to stay on your mailing list. You also need to make sure that you're sending what you promise. So if you're telling people that you're going to be sending an email once a month, and that what the content is, that it's going to be a newsletter or you're going to send information about upcoming events. Make sure that's what you're doing, that you are mailing on the, the time frame that you say and the content that you say. Uh, don't just send things randomly that might cause them to want to unsubscribe. You also want to make sure that you're keeping the email addresses private. Um, people are afraid that if their email address will be sold, and this isn't necessarily just for nonprofits, but this is something that anyone who is growing a mailing list needs to keep in mind. You don't want to have your recipients think that their email address is going to be sold because then they'll be less likely to give you an email address. And again, don't do anything crazy with the unsubscribes. It is required by law that emails have an unsubscribe mechanism. If somebody unsubscribes, you just need to honor that request. Um, not everybody is going to want to read your email. It's probably full of really great information, but sometimes people don't have time or um, you know, it just isn't going to work for them right now and they might unsubscribe. This doesn't mean they won't come back later, but if they do unsubscribe, you need to respect that unsubscribe and not try to mail to them again. So I'm just going to go over a few basics of email design. I have some examples a little bit later in the deck to show you some ideas for creating emails, although we do have specific webinars on how to set up your emails. Basically, what you want to keep in mind when you're designing your email is that it should be easy to read and easy for your recipients to access. So you don't want to use huge images in your email. You don't want to use too many images in your email. And you don't want to do anything crazy with like a dark background with light color. Um, that's really hard on the internet. It's really hard to read on a monitor. It looks okay on this slide where it says, don't do this. Um, but if you had an entire page with a black background, that gets really hard on your eyes. You know, maybe if your readers are all 20, that might work, but not everyone's 20. So it's hard. <laughs> so it's hard. It's hard if you have older eyes, that's what I'm saying. Um, if you need to emphasize something in your email, use bold. Italics are hard to read online, and underlining looks like a link. So just bold a little bit to get people's attention. And also use bullets. Bullets are great. Oh, and I have that on this page. Um, if you're creating a newsletter or even an email, um, you want to keep it relatively short because people are not going to want to um, read a really long email. So limit it to about three to five topics. Put lots of links in your email. 
Um, that way when people are ready to go to your website and do what you want them to do, there'll be a link there for them to do that. Um, one link is not enough. You definitely want a few plus your call to action button. Personaling, personalizing your message helps your recipients um, feel a little more engaged because you're sending an email to them that uh, is sent specifically to them. So you can personalize with the name, you can personalize with the company information if you have that for the person. Um, anything that's in your mailing list can be added to your email. So one of the things that we always have questions from uh, our users is content ideas. So I'm going to go over a little bit. Um, again, I have lots of ideas here, and um, we're, we probably don't have time to go through every single one of them. But um, the way to get started for creating your email or your newsletter is things that you, your recipients are going to be interested in. First of all, you do need to con uh, have content that you promised, as I said earlier. Um, but if there's anything new going on in your organization, do you have a new employee? Do you have new volunteers? Um, is there any advice that you can give to people? You're offering a service. Are there questions that they ask a lot? Maybe you have a frequently asked question um, post on your website. You could use something like that as um, a part of your email, you know, once a month when you're sending out your newsletter. Do you have stories to tell? Did you recently have an event? That's something that people would love to read about. Um, and do you have any advertising? I know that seems kind of strange, but if you have sponsors for um, your events or for your organization, maybe you could focus on one once a month in your newsletter or put the advertising that they have for your sponsors in there, and that can be some of your content. So I have a couple of slides with content ideas um, to help get you started. Success stories, so let your donors and supporters know what you're doing with the money that you've raised for your nonprofit and share some stories about that. And people love stories, so um, including that type of information in your newsletter will help keep them really engaged. Um, behind the scenes story, so maybe um, you can give people an idea of what's going on behind the scenes in your organization and um, maybe give them something new and interesting to look at. Obviously, you can send out thank yous, and you probably would want to do that. Um, so if people came and donated time or money to your organization, um, send out a thank you after the event or after the donation. Um, but you could also put, put that type of information in a newsletter instead of just sending out an email. Um, anything that's coming up next, any new events or um, things that are happening in your organization, let them know. Also, if you have ideas for how your supporters can um, give you some support, even if they're maybe not at your volunteer event, how they can do it in their everyday lives. Uh, also, um, using an email is a great way to get people to take action on an issue, of course, and that was one of the things that I covered a little bit for the call to action. Um, so it's a great way for you to get people to sign a petition or email a member of Congress or donate money. Um, so that's a good idea for your content as well. And as I said, uh, include people. So if you have a new volunteer, if there's someone new on your staff, have people in your email. Include pictures so that the, your recipients know who they're working with and who uh, the new people are at your organization. And again, tell stories. People love to hear stories. So I'm just going to go through a little bit on the reporting tools and some of the numbers, and then Julie's going to talk a little bit about some of the things that they've done at her organization. Um, in vertical response, once your email's gone out, you do get um, reports on how it's gone. And that's a good way for you to know not only how interested your recipients are, you'll also know um, what you're doing right with your email marketing and maybe where you can do improvements. And the, e the reporting will help you do that. So our system is going to track the clicks on the links. So you're going to see which links are the most popular and how many times they've been clicked on. You'll also be able to see who is clicking on the links. So you'll also be able to tell if they're clicking on your call to action button. That information will be part of the reporting. You'll know who's opening your email, and you'll also know the time and the date that they're opening it, which can help you decide when you want to send your email out. You can also do comparisons. So as I said, using the reporting is a great way to measure the success of your campaign, how many people are clicking on a link, um, maybe your donate link or your sign up to be a volunteer link. Um, and you can track that information. And just the screenshot at the bottom on the right there tells you is a, a comparison that you can do. So you can set up 
up to five emails, and you can compare the opens and the clicks. So especially if you're doing some testing, maybe you want to see if people are clicking on your um, call to action button that you created, you'll be able to see that information in the reporting. And what you get from that will help move you to figure out what you want to send in your next newsletter, maybe with a subject line, maybe the date or the time, um, something like that could be, your reporting can help you decide that type of information. And kind of a, another cool thing you can do with once you do see at the recipient level who is opening your email, and this is something we do as well, is start segmenting lists of people who open your emails more often versus those that don't, and maybe you can start engaging those people in a different way because they, you know, if they're opening your emails 80% of the time that they get them, they're, they've got a different kind of relationship with you than other people on the list, and crafting your message towards them can make can make that relationship even stronger. Mm -hmm. And I have a good example um, in a couple of slides of somebody who did segment their list because I didn't take an action. <laughs> so the questions we get all the time at any of our webinars when we talk about reporting is, what is the average open rate? What's the average click-through rate? Um, I got this information from N10. They actually just released a benchmark study for nonprofits. Um, and these are some examples that I took from um, their, their study that they did on open rates for nonprofits. And they show you, um, at the top, <coughs> they show you it broken down, <coughs> excuse me, by the different types of nonprofits that they polled. So you can see, on average, the open rate is between 10 and 16 percent. Um, but then broken down a little more specifically, um, environmental, um, causes have a higher open rate that's about 17% on average. Um, human rights is about 10%. That's kind of tragic. <laughs> um, but you can see it's kind of broken down by the different types of nonprofits. And then at the bottom, they've broken them down by the size of the organization. Um, so usually smaller to medium-sized organizations or lists, if you want to look at it that way, um, have higher open rates, which is definitely something that we see here at Vertical Response as well. And click-through rates, I know you guys are wondering. Um, and these are the average click-through rates that they found when they did their poll. Um, so it looks like, um, on average, it's between about 1.5% and 2.5%, um, which is pretty average just across email marketing. Um, generally, uh, email marketing is around 3% for open rates. So um, for nonprofits, it's about the same. And again, at the bottom, they have them broken down by um, small, medium, and large as well. Um, on the resources slide at the end of the webinar, I do have the URL for this benchmark study if you're interested in that. Um, it's from their website, and uh, you can download that and take a look at it. It's got a lot more information than what I included in here because we're pressed for time. But <laughs> do you have to give, you, give them your email address? To you actually it? don't. Uh, there was something else I signed up for recently that I did have to give my email address for, but I didn't. Wait, did I for this? No, actually, I did. You're right. I did have to give them my email address to download this. They must have sat in on another webinar. They must have done. <laughs> so now I have a couple of examples of emails, um, just to kind of give you an idea of some of the things that you can do with email marketing. So as I said, one of the things you can do is send out newsletters. Um, newsletters are a great way to keep your general population updated on the different things going on in your organization. And it's a great thing to send out on a monthly basis. So even if you don't have an event every month, sending out a newsletter will help keep your organization in people's minds. This is one um, I'm on their mailing list. And um, they send out an email that has information about what's going on in some of the parks here in San Francisco and around San Francisco. And some of the content is great. Not everything in their newsletter is donate or volunteer. So one of the things you want to keep in mind when you're creating your newsletter is you don't want your recipients to feel like all you're trying to do is sell them, right? So you don't want them to go donate, 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 or volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. So try to give them some content that has nothing to do with them giving you time or money. Um, so this has some great examples of some of the things that they um, include in their newsletter. You can also send out 
specific emails. So in addition to sending out a newsletter every month, if you have some kind of event or some fundraiser going on, you can send specific newsletters. And you know, maybe your, your uh, fundraising is for something specific that maybe not everyone on your list is interested in. So you can segment out to those people who are specifically interested in whatever you're doing. So this is an example of a PTA that is trying to raise money for um, new pavement on their playground. And they're really close to getting it done, um, but this is just kind of a um, solo type of email. They send out a monthly newsletter for the PTA, but then they're also doing this specific fundraising, so they sent out this email about that. The next two examples are emails, um, as I said, that they did some segmentation. So this is from the San Francisco Food Bank, which, by the way, their list building trick, well, it's not really tricky, but it's great. We did a volunteer event there, and um, you have to sign like a waiver. So if I like drop a can of tomatoes on my toe, I don't sue them. Or if I wander in front of a forklift, it's not their fault. Um, so you have to sign a waiver, and they have it on the computer. And as you sign up, you have the option of joining their mailing list, and you can give them your email address. So I got on their mailing list just because I volunteered there, and I had to sign the waiver. So they did um, this. They're getting, if they can get people to take this online quiz, they can get a dollar for every person who takes it, up to $5,000. So they were trying to get the people on their list to take this quiz. I happened to receive this while I was on vacation, and I was like, eh, whatever. Don't have time. I'm on vacation. I'm having fun. So because I didn't do anything, a couple days later, they sent me another newsletter, or another email. They changed the subject line. It was a little different. And it says, I'm sour. How about you? And I was like, what in the heck is this? So I opened it. Most of this email is the same as the one they sent before, but the opening part is a little bit different. So this time I was like, okay, that's kind of fun, and I went and took their quiz. So what they did was they took the people who didn't open their email, and they segmented them out and sent them a follow-up email to try to encourage them to do uh, their, their donation thing. So that's a great way for you to use your mailing list as well. If people aren't responding to your emails, you can segment them and maybe send a different subject line like this. This was kind of funny. I was like, I don't know what this is about. So now we're going to have Julie talk a little bit about some of the things that they've done in their organization using email marketing and social media. Hi, Julie. Hi. I was get, glad to give the disclaimer that I'm your sister. I was a little worried people would wonder if you were really just doing all the sex. <laughs> I know. Um, and I am um, excited to be here. I think the first thing I want to say is that I am by no means the expert. Um, <laughs> even in just listening to the first part of this webinar, um, I thought it, I really learned a lot. And thinking about the mobile technology and the use of buttons, I think, is a really helpful thing. Um, so I am with Peak Parent Center, which is an uh, organization that we are, are in Colorado, and we serve the state of Colorado with families who have children that have disabilities. And I am also the parent of two children with Down syndrome, and so I serve a lot and do a lot of work with our local Down syndrome association. So I have a paid job in a nonprofit, and then I have a volunteer job in a nonprofit. And so we use um, the email marketing for lots of different things in both of the organizations that I'm involved in. And one of the things that we have found is we've been a nonprofit here in Colorado for over 26 years is we've done an annual conference on inclusive education every year. And we get some funding from the federal government because we're mandated by law. But we also do events like our conference and other fundraising events to offset what we don't get from federal funds. And um, we saw over time that our registrations were declining, but our costs were higher and higher. We had really high print costs and mailing costs. But as our money was going down, we thought we could certainly save money there. So we turned to email marketing, and we were pleasantly surprised not only that we saved the huge amount of money in printing and mailing, but we saw a huge increase in pre-registration numbers because, like Jill said, we were able to segment out and send messages to people pertaining to maybe the conference attendees that would be of most interest to them. Um, we collect information as required by law about families and their children's different disabilities. And so we were able to know based on our list if a person had a child that might have 
autism, and then we were able to send those people this specific information about the um, conference sessions that would be around autism, and we saw a huge increase from doing just being able to do that. So there are little things that we were able to do, and I highly recommend, and I, I think Jill said that she has resources later, but I highly recommend looking at the tips. I was thinking the newsletters that Vertical Response sends out about how do you change your subject line. All of those things are what we've been able to improve over time because we've, learned, we've certainly learned as we've gone along at things that have worked well and things that we've needed improvement in. Um, another thing that we've been able to do is with our um, Down Syndrome Association here in Colorado, I happen to be in Colorado Springs, um, we do an annual buddy walk, which is a huge awareness fundraising event that we do. And again, we were printing brochures and we had the ability to do online registration, but we were really lacking the ability to get information to people quickly as things were changing. One of the things we found with our, with our buddy walk is people are very competitive when you get out there and you start <laughs> raising money and getting teams going. And so we have an award that we give out for the top um, pledge winner that brings in the most money, but we also have one for the person who brings the team, the largest team. And so we, as we get closer and closer to the event, we start emailing out, you know, the deadlines approaching quickly and the top team has raised this much or the top team is in at 75 teammates and to really get those people, the people's competitive juices going. And we, we have found it to be very successful to use the marketing um, to do those two things. Um, the other thing that we use email marketing for is newsletters. We do newsletters that go out. We also use the opt-in form for legislative alerts because um, we, being in the field of special education and um, educating and caring for people with disabilities, as you could imagine, there's lots of legislation out there. And so we have a list of people who don't want to get mailings from us about our inclusion conference. They only want to get information from us about the legislation updates. So we, we have lots of different ways for people to be able to do that, and the opt-in list have made that really successful for us as well. Another requirement that we have, because we get federal funding, is we're required to do um, annual reports to the Office of Special Education under the special education programs in DC. And vertical response, their collection data, and just um, Jill showed just a brief clip of the one that people have clicked on or, or used. But there is, you can know the number of people you sent it to, the people who opened it, who forwarded it. All of that information makes our reporting so easy. We just submit all of that stuff with all of our reports that we have to do. And so our online presence and our ability to market, to check all that um, is right in line with the reports that we have to do for the federal government. I know not all nonprofits have to do that, but it's also great data to have when you're writing grants. Most nonprofits get funding from grants. And so um, it's great to have all of that information to know how many people you might write a, a grant to increase your your mailing list, those types of things, and so all of that reporting makes that very easy. And Julie has some uh, examples of some of her emails as well. This was, um, my screenshot's not great, but this was an example from your, um, your conference. Yeah, and one of the things that we did with this is um, we were able to have our look, one of the things that we've learned over time as well is that we continue to have that branded look. So the, the top of this is the masthead that was actually anything we printed, anything on site, the name tags, everything, bags, everything that went along with the conference, this was the logo that went on it. So we're able to use that as a JPEG right in our um, conference email that went out. So again, it has the same look to everything we're doing. It's not, we're not having to find a new look or people aren't quite sure what it is. You want to go to the next one? Of course I do. Okay, this I have no your, control. It's for your buddy yeah. walk. So this is for the buddy walk. And again, um, this is using a template. The top of this is a template that was developed by Vertical Response just in their, their um, library. Of your template section? Yep. And um, the colors for the Buddy Walk are blue and yellow, and so um, it worked really well for us to just use. So the first one was one that we developed ourselves using a JPEG that we submitted, that we uploaded. Um, I'm sure I'm not using the technical terms here. You uploaded um, it. That was right. <laughs> I uploaded it. And then this was one we just used from the template. So we've used lots of different ways, again, um, different ways in using the different op options that they have vertical response. And then go to the next one. I'll just talk really quickly. 
So we just did this event. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the increase of autism and the diagnosis of autism. And we were approached with a very short amount of time to promote this 100 cities one night for autism. And it was coming to the Colorado Springs area and we were gonna be a host for it. There was no time to mail anything. There was no time to do anything but e to get it out on social media, to e-blast it out. We put it on Facebook and we Twittered it. Um, we weren't sure we were gonna have anybody who came. We ended up filling the theater and they had to open another theater. One of the things I learned very quickly is when you use social media, we use this on Facebook, you never know who your friends might be. And we happened to have a follower or follower on Twitter or on our Facebook who was with our local media. And so the media picked up the story and ran two morning stories on it. So I know that that helped increase the numbers that we had at this event. The other thing is the use of the forward to friend. Um, again, this is a great opportunity when you have sh very short amount of time. This cost us nothing to get this out. And the, the people that we got there, we had a sign-in sheet, we got new email addresses, we, there was lots of people that were now aware of our organization and our community. And then we also, as people were coming out of this event, had flip cameras, and so we were getting their reactions as they came out so that we can utilize those in other events as we move forward. Great. So that was actually a great segue into Ellery's social media part, since you used a lot of social media for that. Thanks, and, and I'm glad listening to Jill's part about content. A lot of that's going to be the same, so I can kind of fly through some, some areas of that. But, but <laughs> We have a lot of info for you guys today. <laughs> and, and one thing you'll see when we get to it, I think I have it on the slide at some point, is it's really important not for you, for you not to think of email and social media in separate silos. They, they are very much towards the same goal for you, and it's really about communicating and engaging with your supporters um, in, in a you know, opt-in kind of relationship. So a, a follow on Twitter or a fan, a like on Facebook is essentially the same endorsement as a opt-in to your newsletter list. So when it comes to really thinking about it at a high level, your social media marketing and your email marketing really are coming from the same place as far as the nature of the relationship uh, and the kind of content that is important to keep that relationship uh, going. So the way I generally start, and I'm going to just to give you a, a, a brief kind of preview of what we're going to talk about, we're just going to look at some overall um, kind of universal social media strategies, and then I'm going to do a deeper dive on Facebook and Twitter, which are you know the two networks that the nonprofit customers we work with are most primarily interested in. Um, but what I like to say to really lead is that social media can be incredibly intimidating for people who are kind of looking at it from the outside because you see these icons lining the page here on the left and right side and there's only eight of them there and you might only know three or four of them, uh, be able to recognize them. And, and that's kind of the point I'm making is social media is a uh, huge, uh, atmosphere out there and really it's you don't need to be intimidated by that fact and you can pick the social networks that make the most sense for your organization and really focus on them and focus on getting results from them so you want to go and choose platforms that are best suited to your objectives so ask yourself a question from the very beginning what are you hoping to get out of the efforts is this about recruiting volunteers is it about getting activism like Jill had mentioned petitions things like that or is it Literally, is it about the money? Is it about raising <laughs> that money and, and donor appeals? Um, and different platforms are gonna be uh, more appropriate for either. And also your organization is gonna speak to that too. So uh, I have been working with a customer of ours that is a uh, media justice nonprofit. And you know they have a big presence on YouTube, obviously, because they have a lot of video content. But that might not make sense if, if you don't have enough new content in the video domain to continually update that. Um, and another thing that can kind of point you uh, to where you should be uh, playing, if you will, is, is really about where your supporters already are. And you can find that out a couple ways. One is to survey them. You've got an email list, send an email out saying, you know, get social with us. Uh, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Flickr, whatever it is, and, and see, measure those click-through rates, see where people are going post different kinds of content to the different 
networks and see where you're getting the most engagement. That's going to help you shape a strategy moving forward. Uh, and finally, just search. It's uh, something that's actually overlooked a lot, but go on to search.twitter.com or search on Facebook about the cause that uh, your, your organization supports and see, see where supporters of that cause in general are having that conversation and, and you know, become a part of it. And lastly, this is a, uh, something I like to say to both our nonprofit and our for-profit <laughs> <laughs> customers is uh, don't be afraid to ask for advice. You know, social media, one of the nice things about it is the social part uh, and, and the fact that it's relatively new. So there's a host of social media, um, you know, experts out there that are happy to have conversations with you and, and reach out to them via Twitter. Uh, send them a message on LinkedIn and, and say, hey, I'm building up my Facebook page uh, for this nonprofit that I work for. I'd love to know, you know, what, what's been working for other companies you've been seeing. Um, and you'd be surprised what kind of reaction that gets. And just asking those questions starts conversations. And also, those conversations are happening elsewhere because other people are in the same boat you are looking for uh, ways to get more out of their social marketing efforts. So look, look on places like LinkedIn questions or, or Quora or, or Facebook nonprofit re resources to see the conversations that are going on and see if the questions you have are already being answered. So before we dive into platform specific tips, just wanted to kind of go over some universal strategies. For one, uh, the, the first two bullets here are, are, are the big ones, and you know I'll, I'll repeat it for every network. It's about consistency and it's about conversation. So that conversation's happening, and you're not only putting proactive messages out there, but you also have to listen to the messaging that's going on um, among your supporter base. And also, don't be afraid to take it offline. So what I mean by that is that social media is the online, you know beginning nurturing of a relationship, but there is also that social part. And a lot of it, whether it's an event you're holding or a conference you're going to, you, you can marry that offline behavior and that online behavior. So once you start a conversation online, you know, or encourage people to come visit your booth at a conference or to show up for a volunteer event. Uh, the two don't have to uh, exist separately. Moderation is, is more of an issue for um, for-profit businesses. I, I think there's, there, you know, there can be more brand damage, but it's certainly something that happens in the nonprofit space, and it can happen with uh, whether it's a mistake, an errant tweet that's sent by a uh, <laughs> member of your organization, or maybe it's just people out there who disagree with your cause. Uh, whatever it is, there might be some negative conversation, and I would encourage you not to be afraid of that. Uh, I think that you'll find that you have more supporters in your social channels than you do uh, detractors, so to speak. And your supporters, their uh, perception of, of your organization and their uh, affinity for your organization is going to increase when they see you really public, really gracefully handling um, detractors or feedback. Sharing, social media is all about sharing, right? So make it make that easy. Make sure you include share buttons on your website, on your blog, on any emails that you're sending. Uh, Jill touched upon the social sharing feature that we have, uh, but in general, and I'll look at when we look at platform specific stuff. You know, using social plugins to make sure that it's easy enough for any online property that you run for you, your readers and supporters to share that information across their social networks. Um, and finally, the point about don't silo social media and email. So the two are actually work very well together. So make sure that you know on all your social properties, whether it's your Facebook page uh, or anything else, that you have a you offer the ability to opt into your newsletter. And at the same time, utilize your email list to bring people to your social media channels. Email is, you know, a once a week, a once a month kind of communication. Encourage these people who are interested in you enough to subscribe to your newsletter to come join you in a more, you know, community kind of environment where the conversation is ongoing. Lastly, nobody's going to be able to find you if they don't know that you're out there. So make sure that you're promoting your social presence across all of your marketing channels. 
you do traditional, if you're doing direct mail, if you do any radio or, or TV, you know, make sure to mention your social presence uh, and definitely on your email as well. Uh, but I like to remind people that you can't just tell them you're there. Tell your, that's, that's not enough now. They get appeals to like them on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, all the time. So make sure you back that up with a reason why. And, you know, as if big brands and, and consumer good companies have it easy, they can offer giveaways, you know, discounts, things like that. It's a little different for a nonprofit organization. But you get creative. Think about what you have because you do have exclusive things that your supporters are interested in. Maybe it's, you know, social media exclusive, things you don't share in your newsletter. Um, maybe it's just up-to-the-minute news, uh, giveaways from sponsors or supporters, white papers, and, and really that expert knowledge. And I'll show you a couple uh, examples of this. Uh, first, I just wanted to show you what I mean by promoting your social presence across your network. So right here, the Montana Environmental Info Center has on their home page you know, all of their social links there are in a prominent space on the right sidebar. Facebook, Twitter, their blog, YouTube, it's, it's obvious where they are and you can go seek them out there. When it comes to giving people a reason why, I, there's a couple of good examples here. One, uh, Dog Bless You, which I actually just found out about the other day. John Hayden, who uh, I'll show you the link to his blog and our resources section uh, pointed out their campaigns. And what they do is they actually match um, pledged donations to likes. So they get a foundation to say, you know, for every like in this quantity uh, that the page gets, we'll donate, you know, money. Sometimes this is for veterans living with PTSD. They did a thing that had to do with sending rescue dogs to tsunami relief efforts in Japan. Uh, and this is a way that if you aren't you don't have a product that you can give away or discounts or things that you know brands and businesses have there's things for the cause and for these causes that your supporters are passionate about that are just as much of a incentive to like something and you know they have this great graphic attached to it um, there's a, there's a lot really nice about this uh, I also wanted to point out on the left hand side of the page you'll notice that the Facebook page for dog bless you likes other causes, goes out and likes dog-related causes. That's something, uh, as a organization page on Facebook, you're uh, able to do. And it both says something about your affinities and, and your brand as a nonprofit, but it's also, as we'll get into content later, the more like-minded organizations that you're connected with on Facebook, the more content you get fed to you that you can then reshare. So think about who you like. And Beth is another great resource for nonprofit organizations using social media. Um, I think this is a neat example here of, of what she has on her welcome screen. A, she has a welcome tab, which instead of defaulting to the wall when you visit her Facebook page, she has a specific welcome tab here. And you'll see it's a very simple call to action, but it actually speaks exactly to what I'm talking about, is you don't necessarily need to have a giveaway per se, but she says join the fan page to discuss how to use social media with your nonprofit colleagues. As, as you know, a marketer for a nonprofit organization, that's something that's valuable to you. And she, from the very minute that you first visit the Facebook page, you see this, join the fan page and this is why. And I think, I think that's a great, great idea when you don't have a specific giveaway or incentive to use. So looking at Facebook specifically, and I'll, I'm going to go quick over these because I'd, okay, <laughs> I'd, I'd rather show you actual examples than just read off the slides. So as far as content, it, you've got a ton of stuff already, right? Whether it's success stories, whether it's statistics about your cause, videos and photos of events, uh, hosted versions of your emails, you have things out there to get started with. And moving forward with content, you really want to recognize Facebook for what it is, which is really this community environment and this ability to really mobilize your supporters. So think about how you can do that and include calls to actions um, for people to participate on the page and post on the page and share. And so let's, let's look at some people who are doing good jobs there. 
Uh, Community Center of St. Bernard, this is one of our customers, and again, this is a welcome tab. So this is the first thing you see when you go to their page, and there's a lot of stuff going on here that's good. One is that specific call to action saying what they're about right off the bat. Uh, four years later, people still need help, and some nice imagery there, good visual. It's much more uh, aesthetically pleasing than just seeing the wall when you first come to the page. Down below, they've also got an opt-in for their newsletter, and they've got links to their other social properties. This is an action-packed uh, <laughs> little tab here uh, that's doing a lot of things right. Uh, dog bless you again. From a content perspective, I mean, look at this. Thousands of likes, hundreds of comments, and all they're doing is sharing pictures of what you might say is success stories, uh, you know, or also user-generated. These are these are pictures of the cause and what they're out there doing, and, and people who support them, I mean, that, that's engagement right there. That's, some, that's the reason that they like the page and want this stuff showing up in the news feed. So I would encourage you to, to share as much you know, relevant kind of um, content and really engaging content as possible. Looking at some other things, Real Girls is a, a media organization based in Seattle. They're actually, uh, I hope that you've all already seen the <laughs> new, new feature on our Facebook page, the Vertical Response uh, Featured Nonprofit, where I am selecting uh, on a recurring basis a nonprofit customer of ours who's using social media and email really well uh, and, and talking about them and featuring them. So that's a tab on our page that you can check out. Um, Real Girls is the one currently, uh, and there's two examples here from their page. One, relevant news. So it's not, it goes back to the self-promotional piece. It's not all about them, right? It's also, it's, it's news that relates to the cause, but isn't an article directly about the organization. But uh, presumably, people who are interested in your organization are interested in the cause that you support. So news about that is perfect content for you. And also engaging content, so videos, photos, things that people can really react to. Um, and, and like. And like. Or uh, comment on. We'll see that with insights, what that means. Tag other pages. Green Halloween does a great thing here. They actually get a double whammy. They tag Plum Organics and the Ellen DeGeneres show. And <laughs> God only knows how many fans she has on Facebook. Uh, but what happens by doing this is that you're actually going to your status update is going to show up in the news feed of these organizations that you're tagging. So it's going to open it up to a whole new audience. And maybe fans of Plum Organics say, oh, Plum Organics is partnering with Green Halloween. Let's, let's check that out. Um, so that's a great way to get your, expand the reach of your message. Uh, and along this, in the same vein, sharing other people's status. So here's Peak sharing uh, something from the Advocacy Institute. So when you're looking for content, the more pages you like and the more content you're getting, that's feeding uh, your ability to share more. There's also tools beyond just your profile that you can really uh, leverage for, for more success. So we're going to look at some examples of that, but quickly it's insights, uh, using a mobile app when you're out and about, when you're at events, take pictures and update right away. Just because you're not at the desk doesn't mean that you can't be updating things. Uh, social plugins and applications which are available for Facebook. So Insights does a whole lot. It's super powerful, uh, but I'm just going to show a couple examples of what I use it for personally. So one is looking at uh, feedback and posts. So Insights will actually tell you which of your posts are getting the most feedback, which is measured based on likes and comments and things like that. Uh, and so you can see it start crafting your message based on that, right? So if you see that pictures are getting you way more feedback than when you post links to articles, maybe you need to start focusing more on, on those kind of status updates. Uh, another part of insights that I think you'll find really helpful, especially as you start building out new tabs, is total tab views and um, external referrers. So tab views is going to show you where on your Facebook page people are viewing and interacting. And if you, you might find see some surprises, see people are hopping over to your newsletter sign up tab more. Uh, than a news tab or, or what have you, and maybe start putting more energy into building up the pages or tabs that people are viewing more. And external referrers is always good to know, just like with your website, 
that you can see if people are hopping from your blog to Facebook often, maybe you need to make the link to Facebook more prominent on your blog, uh, or things like that. So it's called Insights for a reason. You can pull a lot of <laughs> things out of it. I encourage you to explore it. Uh, Facebook offer also offers a ton of resources for nonprofits. If you just go to Facebook.com, I want to say slash nonprofits, but certainly if you just go to the search box and search nonprofits on Facebook, ton of resources there that are going to tell you how to do a lot of things that you might not know were even available to you on Facebook. Um, social plugins, you see that the, sh the send and like buttons on the top of this page as well as tweet, but if you've got a microsite or, or even your website or your blog, any content, the more you enable sharing, the, the more it's going to get out there. And apps, apps allow you to do uh, custom tabs, which is what we've been talking about. And there are free options out there, uh, as well as paid, um, none of which I endorse particularly over one over the other. Um, but there's, there's plenty of options there. And what this does is let you give, have a little more control over the look and feel of your Facebook page. So um, this is, you know, a feature thing, and that's something I think they're they're featuring the, the pet of the week, and who even knew you could adopt a duck? Um, <laughs> a duck named Timothea. But you can. Um, but maybe this is featured volunteer. Maybe, this, you know, there's, it's a great way to give new kind of fun content on your page. You can also use it to create um, actual action tabs. So, you know, whether it's a petition or an opt-in to your newsletter, or anything else, you can create these custom tabs um, using just a little bit of HTML. So <laughs> Twitter, Jill. <laughs> Jill's been mad at me from the very beginning because I made, <laughs> I made so many slides, but I thought I'd have more time. Uh, <clears throat> Twitter, I'm going to skip this because it's, again, the same thing. Repurpose I don't want to freak content. anyone out. We are recording this. I will put the slides up on our... Um, recorded webinar page so you can take a look at this later. So don't try to think you have to frantically write everything down on these slides when you see them for two seconds. You, you'll have um, these available. But all of, all of these bullets will be illustrated in the examples that we give. Oh, great. Going forward. So let's get right into them. The Exploratorium, a uh, great museum here in San Francisco. So you'll see from the arrows the things that I want to point out. Uh, first is the, the example of repurposing content that you already have. So photos, they threw this event, Exploratorium After Dark. Photos are really engaging, they're fun, um, and, and an easy thing for you to link to from Twitter. So that's, that's something there. And the other thing that they're doing in that same tweet on the top is uh, at mentioning other partners and people that they were involved with, which uh, is, you know, calls that out. They see it, often those people will retweet those pictures as well, or whatever the content is. And it's a good way to get that message spread and involve more people in the conversation. Along the same lines, that arrow at the bottom is pointing to a tweet where somebody actually shared a picture from that they had at the Exploratorium. And Exploratorium retweeted that, thanked them for sharing it, but then they're passing it on to their message. So you're letting your uh, supporters, if whether you're throwing events or you just did a big fundraising drive, and people search terms, put out search terms for your organization, see what people are talking about related to it. Hey, I just donated to Peak Parent, uh, or <laughs> whatever. I, you know, I'm, I'm going, I'm going for number one in the buddy walk. Uh, whatever it is, you see that it comes up in in your search terms and retweet it and thank people for mentioning you. Nature Conservancy, um, on, on their actual what they're tweeting, they do, this is a great example of news that, like I showed on Facebook, is not about the organization, but about the cause that they support. So they have no problem when it comes to, you know, environmental issues, finding content and finding issues to talk about. And so that fills their Twitter stream. On the left, I wanted to point out some great things they do. One is introducing their tweeters, right? So it actually gives this personal um, effect to it where you actually know there's people behind it and you have, and it increases that kind of personal relationship. Um, and then on the top, they are doing the you know, cross-promotional thing. They are showing where they are across the web uh, and being consistent with their brand uh, on the Twitter profile. 
same with Share Our Strength. They've got this great branding going on. Um, they also, and what I really wanted to point out here is the use of hashtags. So all these tweets have the no kid hungry hashtag. This is a good way to, uh, you know, start a movement, so to speak. So if you're working on a particular campaign or a particular drive, assign a hashtag to it and encourage your supporters to, to have that conversation and, and include it in there. So we should probably move the rest of the slides because we're already past 2 o'clock. I'm sorry, but we'll take some questions. And as I said, the slides are going to be available on our help site um, and also um, the recorded version, so you can take a look at some of this. Um, so I just want to point out a couple things on the re resources tab, and then we're going to, or this slide here, and then we'll take some questions. Um, our help site is help.verticalresponse.com, and if you click on the tab that says webinars, you'll see recorded webinars there. So you'll be able to see this one up there tomorrow. And I'll also post the slides from this deck up there as well. There's a link from that um, recorded webinars page to see the slide deck. So if you want to take a look at some of the resources that Ellery has for social media that I just made him skip through, <laughs> you can take a look at those at your leisure instead of um, watching them go by. Um, also, if you're not a VR user, if you're a 501c3 nonprofit, you get 10,000 free credits every month. So you can basically use our system for free unless you have a pretty large mailing list. And then you get a discounted price for purchasing credit. So you might want to take a look at that. Um, we have guides. As I said, um, 50 Ways to Grow Your Email List is not specific to nonprofits, but a lot of the information in there is relevant to anyone growing a mailing list, whether it's a nonprofit or not. And that's free. I also said that the uh, N10 benchmark study is available from their website. That's the link to it. If you just go to their website, n10.org, which is a great resource, by the way, for nonprofits, um, at the bottom of their main home page is the link to the benchmark study. And then Ellery has some social media links that he can talk to. Yeah, I, I mentioned them both as I was talking, but both John Hayden and Beth Cantor are people that I read their blogs all the time. John's also associated with the nonprofit Facebook guy. In fact, I think he might be the nonprofit Facebook guy. <laughs> um, but these are all social media specific resources that are that are specific to nonprofits, um, whether it's just changes in admin controls or anything else that you need to be on top of. I definitely suggest, you know, put those in your RSS feed. They're, they're really, really good info. Okay, so we're going to try to take some questions. Um, we know we've gone well over. We had a lot of slides. I'm on performable.com. I don't see how to make buttons. You need to go to performable.com slash buttons, and then you can make um, the buttons from there. Just take a screenshot. Don't use their JavaScript. Um, let's see. Can a social media link be placed on every article in an email or only one per emailing? Um, that's a good question. Actually, and that brings up two things that we can talk about. Um, one is in a week and a half, we're going to have some new social sharing tools available. So um, giving people the ability to share email across uh, Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn um, will be much easier, and it'll be part of the reporting statistics. Um, so uh, that'll be available in a week and a half. So that allows people to share the content, or your whole email. If you want to share a specific article on social media, that article has to be live somewhere on the internet. So if it's an article on your blog or someone else's blog, you need the URL first in order to make it shareable, just that article shareable. Um, and if you're looking to do that, if you go to our help site, help.verticalresponse.com, and search for Facebook, that information will come up, how you can set up a link to a specific article in your email. And it's up to you. I mean, maybe there's a particular article you need to point people to, and you'll be able to do that. When a person unsubscribes, does Vertical Response automatically stop us from sending them emails? We actually do. It's part of your reporting, so once your email goes out, you'll see who's unsubscribing. And you'll also um, have it marked in the mailing list as an unsubscribe. We're not going to delete anything from your list because that's your data, um, but we will prevent you from mailing to any unsubscribes. Is there a design format that works especially well in vertical response, i.e. Wizard, Freeform, or Canvas? I notice Wizard tends to have higher open rates and click-through rates. Any thoughts? 
Um, that's interesting. Um, really, as far as Wizard Freeform or Canvas goes, it shouldn't really affect your open rates. And maybe you had a really great subject line when you used your wizard. Um, subject lines really impact your open rates highly. Um, or maybe you sent it on a specific day or time or something that your recipients really responded to. Um, I don't think either of them, as far as opens or clicks, would be um, specifically better. Um, they're really more tailored to your skill level in creating the emails or your um, interest in spending a lot of time on um, formatting it. So if you don't know HTML, I would suggest you use the wizard. Otherwise, you can use any of them um, to have successful uh, emails. I thought best practices was to not have a big masthead across the top because it's hard to open. Well, it kind of depends. And again, my screenshots for some of my email, um, emails that I had were not maybe the best, and they did make some of the images look bigger than they actually were. Um, the thing is, you can have um, an image across the top, like a banner across the top. It's a little harder on cell phones um, because that's a really big image for them to open. Um, but if people are blocking images with their emails, um, the masthead has really no impact. Um, if you have good alt text there, they'll see that instead. Um, but they, they're also the first thing that people see. So in the example of the parent email, um, it had all of the information about the um, upcoming conference. It had the time and the date and all of that information in that masthead image. So if the image is displaying, all the information people need to see is going to be there. If it's not displaying, all the information is in the contents of the email. For a nonprofit organization, would you recommend a group page or a like page? And I think they're asking the group page versus a organization page or a fan page. Um, I would, I, I push organizations that I work to, to to create fan pages. So that's where you go in, create, it's the equivalent of a company page, but you can actually go in and specify that you're a nonprofit organization. A group page uh, can be helpful if you do have specific groups that you're working with and that you want to communicate with and send messages out to a group, but it's really meant more about that creating groups that are specific to certain information channels. Whereas a fan page is really where people can come like your page and interact with your page um, regardless of any side affiliation. So what I would say is if there is a, um, a reason for you to be working that where you need groups and groups work for your org, to have a fan page that then runs and links to several individual groups. But I think the fan page for your nonprofit organization is, is the first place to be on Facebook. So um, I have a couple of suggestions for um, probably about 50 of the questions that we have. Um, this webinar was really kind of um, directed to specific information for people creating emails for nonprofits or creating posts for um, social media for nonprofits. Um, we do have um, a series of webinars that we've recorded about using social media kind of the basics. So if you're not used to some of the terms for um, Twitter, for example, because we have probably 20 people asking what a hashtag is, um, we have a couple of resources. If you go to the help site and click on webinars, we have Twitter for your business, which was recorded in April, I think, April. a couple months ago. Um, and it has that a lot a of fun one. <laughs> it has a lot of information for um, w some of the specifics for using Twitter. We also did um, Facebook for Your Business, which is recorded and on our webinars page. And by the way, these are all free. All you have to do is click on, uh, you just have to go to our help site and click on webinars. You don't even have to, you don't, have to give you don't even have to give an address. email address. <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't even have to be using vertical response to access these resources. So if we're saying things that are confusing, also on our guides page we have some information on social media, um, what hashtags are and things like that for Twitter and Facebook. Um, also, um, somebody's asking a question about creating emails for um, phones, and we had we just had a webinar a couple weeks ago um, specifically on that. So if you want to go look at the recorded version of the webinar, that's on our help site, and there will be a guide coming out this month, um, so you can take a look at that as well, um, which answers probably 20 of the questions that we have here. <laughs> we had a lot of questions about hashtags. 
How do you know which hashtags are already available? Is there a website dedicated to hashtag names out there on Twitter? Uh, there are a few websites. In fact, Jill, if you wouldn't mind clicking back to my Twitter tools slide. Um, there we go. Uh, the, that third bullet, tweet meme, trendistic, and twit scoop. Uh, yes, those names are all ridiculous. Um, <laughs> But it makes it, me laugh every it, time. <laughs> it goes with the territory. Um, those are kind of directories of different things that are trending. Um, but what I would say, you can make anything a hashtag. So the idea, what I was trying to say as far as creating your own for people to start talking about is, say you have an event or a specific campaign. So we'll use the buddy walk example. So maybe hashtag buddy walk is what you tell people to talk about. So you're not necessarily going out and looking for an existing hashtag because it's your event, it's your your drive that you're creating. And so what you do by creating that hashtag and encouraging people to use it is really um, A, making it searchable for you to see who's talking about your event. Um, and also, you know, letting people who are following people who are talking about the event uh, click on it and figure out what what exactly that conversation is about. Um, we can't. Uh, I can't make short emails. Any tips? Um, actually, I have a couple of tips. Um, first of all, if you find that you have just so much information for your email that you can't make a short email, you might want to try sending out two emails a month instead of one. Um, your recipients, if your email gets too long, your recipients are never going to make it to the end, no matter how fascinating your content is. So maybe splitting it up will be able to give them um, a be better access to the information that you're sending to them. The other thing is um, if you're writing um, part of your email that has to do with a blog post or information from another site, all you need to do is put a couple of sentences from the article that you're referring to and then link to it. There isn't any reason you need to have an entire article in your email. Um, people will never sit and read it. Um, unless they have absolutely nothing else to do. Maybe they're sitting in the police station waiting for something to happen and they have some spare time on them. Why the, their hand? How about the DMV? What's the I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if somebody has a lot of time on their hands for whatever reason, um, they might sit and read a really long email, but for the most part, they won't. So give them just a little snippet of the content and link them to the page where they can go read it. And they'll go read it when they have more time to do it. And they'll see what a little bit of the content is, and it's kind of a teaser, and that will make them want to read it some more. Um, OK, so we still have lots of questions, but unfortunately, we have gone way over. <laughs> Sounds like a good blog post. So. Yeah, it probably could be. It could probably be two smaller webinars coming up in the future as well. Um, besides our um, social sharing features that are being upgraded um, later this month, we also have event management tools that are coming out next month. So if you put on events, as I imagine a lot of um, nonprofits do, um, we will have an event management tool that ties into sending out emails through our system, um, and you'll be able to sell tickets or have tickets available for people to attend your event um, and manage that through your vertical response account. Um, so look for announcements for those, uh, those two um, new improvements for vertical response. Um, also, as I said, this, the recorded version and the slides will be available on our help site tomorrow. So you'll be able to go through some of the tips that we talked about on our webinar, and you can look at the slides that I made Ellery skip <laughs> if you want to look at the and slides. If you, find, you can uh, send me Ellery Long on Twitter if you want to ask me any questions. I'm happy to um, answer them or point you in the right direction. So that's E-L-L-E-R-Y-L-O-N-G. <laughs> it was Twitter. at the beginning. It's on the first slide. Um, so I want to thank everyone for coming out today. I also especially want to thank Julie for being here and presenting some of the um, experiences she's had using social media and email marketing for her nonprofit. Thank you, and yeah, thanks everyone. Have a great day.